good evening dear participants i welcome you all for the webinar the experts talk and we have uh, with us today uh, dr ranjit singh and uh, as you have already been aware of it today's session is about the personal identification by skeleton material so indeed uh, uh, this is one such a different topic apart from what we have discussed so far regarding the documents fingerprints and you know uh, digital and cyber so i hope uh, that the suitable audience for this uh, particular uh, topic is uh, has already you know uh, been with us by now so with this uh, i would request uh, kritika mishra to give a introduction about the speaker for the day one moment thank you anand sir good evening everyone myself pratika mishra and uh, with a great privilege and honor i would like to introduce speaker of our today's session dr ranjit kumar singh on the topic personal identification by skeleton material dr ranjit kumar singh is an adroit professional with more than 13 years of experience in forensic science he has uh, dr singh is a founder and managing director of the cyber india private limited one of a very few uh, private companies providing forensic science services he has completed his msc from delhi university and later phd he is also qualified with ces chfi and ec council he has many national and international papers as well as books published on his name he has also provided numerous legal reports for honorable court delhi police ubi police etc He has been into the arena of forensic science in 2005 till date with the same positivity. He has given his expertise opinion about more than 3,000 cases. His contribution and work experience is not limited within the nation, as he has also visited and delivered lecture in the Department of Chemistry in UCC, that is University College of Ireland, Trinity College. Dr. Ranjit Singh is heavily involved with forensic investigations, forensic training, forensic education, and has made himself available to conduct the TVI workshop to share his knowledge, experience, and expertise with the participants of this workshop. So, over to you, Dr. Ranjit uh, Ranjit Kumar Singh, sir. Uh, thank you, Kritika. Thank you, Fanda, sir, and uh, welcome all the uh, audience for today's session. <clears throat> Today, we are going to discuss about uh, how the uh, bones or other skeletal material can be used for the personal identification where we are uh, <clears throat> doing the investigation in the age of the dna how these are important uh, even the dna uh, is uh, nowadays in a high light the dna is uh, more important than any other kind of evidence uh, which we uh, recover related to the human body so how we uh, can see that how skeletal material is uh, uh, important so uh, two thing i just want to uh, make uh, clarification over here uh, see uh, i am not the one who is giving the expert opinion on skeletal material remains i studied this during my msc and phd because i am my msc and phd in anthropology and i learned the uh, like uh, identification and other things by the different dbi uh, workshop which we conduct into the all over the world like we conducted recently into the sudan and other country so uh, so uh, by this declaration i am going to start my presentation how that uh, personal identification by the skeletal material is uh, by the skeletal material we can get so although uh, i have very uh, i got a less time because i am still involved in one investigation i am not in the place to deliver this lecture but i will try my best to give you the uh, some insight about the personal identification through the skeletal material how the skeletal material play an important role for the individual identification as we all know personal identification was done by the several method it can be a fingerprint it can be a lip print bite mark footprint shoe print blood saliva semen dna fingerprints uh, and the bone bone is an important part which we are going to discuss today so and apart from the bone there are other things like image analysis is there hair analysis gait pattern analysis facial features handwriting examination scar surgery 
uh, and the voice that to Steve. So uh, you all, uh, you all have studied about uh, all these topics, which is used for the personal identification into different uh, expert talks because this is the 37. So I think all the topic has been covered by the respective speakers. So I'm going to cover today about the how the bone play an important role for the individual identification and how it can be done and how the forensic anthropology laboratory work, what are the instruments required for the forensic anthropology there, and basically how the opinion is uh, reliable in the court of law uh, in uh, era of even uh, nowadays also. So with this, uh, forensic science, you know, uh, as we know, there are different fields of the forensic science, question document, fingerprint, cyber uh, forensic, forensic biology, toxicology, chemistry, odontology, entomology, forensic medicine, criminalistic, forensic psychology, forensic engineering. So these are the different fields where the different expert opinion came for the personal identification. But apart from this, there is another field which is known as forensic anthropology, which is uh, uh, used for the personal identification. So a few basic instrument is required for the uh, measurement of the bone because there is two things in the forensic uh, anthropology we uh, studied. One is a metry, another is a scopy. Metry where the measurement we do, like a craniometry, osteometry, somatometry, and a scopy where we do the physical examination, like a osteology, we study the bones, uh, or somatoscopy, we study the facial features of the individuals, how the individual looks, looks, and it is used for the personal identification of the individual. So, uh, so a basic instrument is caliper is required, and uh, and. Uh, and one uh, osteometric board is required. Osteometric board is very common in colleges, those who are teaching the anthropology, forensic anthropology, by which we used to make a measurement on the long bones for calculation of the indices. And by that, we can establish the height of an individual, what a height can be of the individual. So uh, now caliper coming into the digital format also. So it is easy uh, so that uh, less error during the calculation done. Earlier, when we were in the MSc and PhD, when we do the measurement on the bones, we used to do the uh, uh, measurement uh, through the manual caliper. And this manual caliper always uh, gives some error. That's why we used to take a three or four measurement. But in a uh, digital, there is more accuracy than the manual <clears throat> caliper. So this is the one instrument which is required into the forensic anthropology lab. For measurement on a cranium, we require a cranium for measurement uh, things. And uh, apart from the long bones where we require the osteometric board. So in a cranium, there are different measurements, different things which is used for the personal identification, either the skulls of the male or of the female, what are the different uh, protuberance, what are the uh, length, what are the breadth. So all these things uh, are used for the measurement. And uh, craniophore is used for the, uh, craniophore is the kind of instrument you can see here. Here the skull, uh, uh, skull uh, fitted and by fitting of the scale, then we use the caliper for the measuring the different uh, measurement or the different indices, calculation of the different indices on a cranium. So before measurement, we require to arrange the bones according to their manual, according to their parameters and what bones and what kind of instrument is required. Like for measurement of the uh, pubis girdle, what kind of instrument we use for measurement of the femur, humerus, tibia, fibula, what kind of instrument we require. So these are the things which is required. Uh, uh, these are the manual which is required for the measurement. So like th these are the basic uh, uh, instrument which is required for forensic anthropology, required by the forensic anthropologist for measurement and establishing the individual height. So uh, these bones are belongs to the living being. So uh, for on the humanitarian ground, we require to store that bone in a, into a very uh, sophisticated manner. We cannot uh, take a bone in any manner. So uh, humanitarian forensic orbit teach us that uh, we require to place the bone in a proper cardboard. Uh, we should tie with a different kind of uh, uh, like a thread or other things so that uh, it, it can give, a, even it's a bone, but it's required respect on the humanitarian ground. So uh, these kind of boxes are used for storage of the bones. Uh, once it is uh, come to the laboratory for the examination. So usually we find the bones in this conditions and this conditions like if any, we can say earthquake or any kind of disaster happened where the uh, body uh, decay after some time and then only bone is uh, available. So these bones are useful 
for the personal identification and these wounds are then required to assemble in a laboratory and in laboratory we always look for the five main questions what actually we can do in a laboratory and what are the things we require to do into laboratory so in laboratory uh, after the remains which uh, properly recovered and properly packed into the cardboard boxes uh, they should send to the laboratory for analysis which uh, involves the answering of the main question and what are these questions so question number 1 is the are the uh, remains or the bones which is collected from the site of the disaster or the scene of the crime either is a human or the non human because sometimes uh, uh, there are there are very uh, much chances that uh, bones of the non human also available during the disaster so how you can identify the bone either it is from the uh, human being or the non human being? so first task for the every forensic anthropologist that uh, we have to examine the bone on the characteristics either is from the human or is from the non human second uh, the bones remains uh, like uh, related to the conflict disaster situation in the question like uh, either the person was there or not so conflict of interest is all, also always uh, important for identification of the individual uh, which is uh, you know victim of a disaster or any other kind of crime scene situation so <clears throat> third point how many individual do we recover or remain uh, represent like uh, you know uh, this uh, if i say uh, there are lots of bones so it uh, look like this is from the one person but there is a chance that this can be of the two person also so the separation of the bone is required according to the human anatomy according to the skeletal system of the human where which bone can be uh, affect if there are uh, three uh, femur available or three humerus is available so then definitely there is belongs from the more than two individual uh, more, uh, more than one individual it may be of the two individual it may be of the three individual also so for that we require to segregation on the basis of uh, recovered material either is from the one individual or is from the more than one individual then fourth point we have to who are they actually so uh, for the personal identification we require to establish the height of the individual we require to establish the identity of the individual what are their identity like uh, if there is some uh, you know uh, some fracture or other things are available into the bones or some artificial things which is used for in a bone during the fracture so that can be a easily method apart from the dna by which it can be established that yes this bones is belong to the that individual and if there is a suspect of one suspect is of the 6 feet height another suspect is of the 5 feet height and there are only two missing person so on the basis of uh, uh, height uh, stature estimation we can reach to the conclusion that it is belongs from the one individual and which is belongs from the 5 feet or the 6 feet so like this we can establish the four point like who are they and what are their identities so that we can hand over that uh, remain to the uh, victim family or we can establish uh, in a uh, crime related cases we can establish that bone yes this bones are belong from an individual who uh, was a disease or who was killed by a person like you all have heard about the uh, nithari uh, case so in nithari case thousand of uh, like a uh, number of bones was recovered from the uh, drain and that was identified individual wise their age wise their sex wise and their uh, uh, like uh, uh, height wise and they uh, these are Uh, identified on the basis and their identity were established on the basis of few measurement so similarly what are the cause of death uh, by the bone it is very difficult to establish the cause of death in the last i'll discuss one uh, case uh, where it was uh, opined that it was a uh, strangulation just by seeing the skeleton so it's uh, uh, not advisable i uh, as per my opinion it is not advisable to give any opinion just on the basis of uh, skeletal material which we recover and the cause of death uh, or like a strangulation we cannot give such kind of opinion so so and the uh, fourth point what are the uh, fifth point is what are the cause of death cause of death can be sometimes established if there is uh, some sharp instrument or some sharp uh, injuries are present or the bone are fractured by some uh, uh, instrument which give a sharp cut so by that way we can establish that these instrument are used for killing a person so this can be uh, helpful in a laboratory analysis that the cause of death uh, by a uh, individual so uh, next question always is uh, when did the death occur so by uh, uh, by the skeletal material by seeing the 
condition of the skeletal material, uh, we can uh, somehow we can reach to the death, uh, how the death occurs. If it is uh, tissues is not intact, the tissue is completely decayed. So we can establish that, yes, that was of the some uh, uh, period. So uh, next is, uh, uh, was the body dis uh, disturbed after the death? So position, lining position of the body, lining position of the bones by which we can see that, yes, body is disturbed or not. Then we can establish what are the gender, age, and the race of the individual, and what actually causes death. What is the cause of death? Then what kind of death it was? It was a homicide, suicide, accidental, natural death, or the it's, it's still undetermined, like in a case of Sinagora. So bones were recovered long back. It was stored into the hospital. Then it goes uh, to for the examination after the long back. So uh, in this uh, period where, where we uh, lack a more period, then it's very difficult to establish the cause of death, like it's a homicide, suicide, or accidental, or the natural death. So uh, <laughs> then uh, individual have any anatomical peculiarities, like a patient of the polio, or uh, some accident, or some kind of anomaly is present into the bone, sign of some disease, some old injuries are present into the bone, by which it is also helpful to establish the individual identity. Then can the individual uh, height, body weight, and the thigic establish? Yes, it can be established. And the facial features, so 3D facial reconstructions. Nowadays, uh, many uh, experts are doing the 3D facial uh, feature reconstruction by the skeletal material, by which they reach to the somehow conclusive uh, faces, somehow conclusive things, uh, and they give that, uh, yes, this is a appropriate, the most appropriate face, which can be recreated by the available skeletal material or the available uh, skull. So this is a facial feature which is used for the reconstruction. Then uh, bones are classified particularly into the four types, long bones, short bones, flat, and the irregular bones. So what are the long bones? Long bones like a tibia, uh, fibula, femur, uh, so uh, humerus. So these are the long bones, which is longer and they are wide and they include bones in the arm, legs, hand, and the feet. The short bones are approximately as long as they are the wide, they are found in the wrist, ankle, and the other places. And the flat bones are flat, which is enclosed, the soft tissue in it. And they are includes uh, most bones like a skull, bones of the skull, bones of the scapula, bones of the sternum, hip bone, and the ribs. And the irregular bones uh, are called as the, uh, which is irregular in shape, like a vertebral column or the, uh, some other bones which is available into the skull or uh, uh, sternum and, or other places where the shape is not fixed. Such kind of bones are known as irregular bones. So on this basis, uh, human body, uh, you know, uh, you can see these are the main characteristics which is used uh, for the is, uh, individual identification, like skeletal, uh, skull play an important role, medieval play, clerical, sternum, zygoid process, humerus, ilical press, uh, radius, ulna, uh, coex, uh, and uh, pubis, uh, femur, fibula, tibia. So these are the bones which play a personal individual identification of the person. Particularly, once we do in anthropology, uh, not in the forensic anthropology, but in the anthropology, we used to do the estimation of the age, sex, race, and the stature. So how it is done? So these different indices are used for the identification, different indices useful for the identification of the person. And by that, a uh, few indices or the few landmarks show the feature of the female, few landmarks show the feature of the male. So on that basis, I'm going to present one uh, uh, photograph where you can see uh, if this is a male and this is a female uh, skull, uh, cranium, uh, sorry, skull. And in this, you can see in a male, the uh, uh, forehead is a sloping while in a female is a vertical forehead. Uh, if we talk about the zygomatic arch, it, it is a wide in a male and it is a narrow in a female. If we talk about the rug mandible, so mandible is large in a male and more pointed, uh, more small are the gracile in a female. If you talk about the chin, it is square in a shape in a male and while it is a more pointed in a female. And uh, similarly, the wide ascending ramus and uh, present in a male while the narrow ascending ramus is present into the female. Large mastoid process is present into the male and the small mastoid process in the female. And large rugged vessel rest, uh, crest was in a male and while the small, a smooth muscle crest was in a female. So these on these uh, few features, these are the few features 
by which you can, if you find any skull from the scene of crime or the disaster, by uh, these kind of feature, by uh, just uh, having a, you know, uh, mor morphological uh, uh, things, uh, by just touching and by uh, having the physical property which shown uh, by that we can establish uh, either it's a male or it's a female. So, like that. So I'm going to show this uh, table, and in this table you can see the size of the uh, size of the male is big, and the female is uh, uh, a small. Cranial mass is in a male is uh, blocky or the messy, while in a female is a rounded, and the taper at uh, top. Temporal ridges are more uh, prominent uh, in a male and less in a female. Some uh, uh, supraorbital margins are round and dull, uh, and uh, sharper in a female. Zygomatic bones uh, are more pronounced in a male and the less pronounced in a female. Mandible is squared in a male, as I discussed earlier through the image, and uh, more rounded into the female. Forehead are rounded and sloping into the male and why they're terminated at a bro, uh, uh, as a, uh, in a female. Then uh, uh, superciliary arc are large and pronounced uh, in a um, male and smaller in a female. Gonian is a, a flared and uh, uh, sharply angled while the less angled into the less flattered into the female. Mastoid are uh, range of the medium to large in a male, while the small to medium into the female. Nasal upper cell is high, thin, sharp margin in a male, while in a female it is a lower, wider, and the rounded margin. Mandible gonial angles is a less in, uh, and obtuse in a male, while it is a more obtuse in a female. And it's a flatter, and again, it's a different flare, uh, flare in a female cases. So these are the few differences on which basis if you, uh, if you find any skull uh, at the scene of crime or if you find any uh, skull at the disaster site by this or any anthropological excavation, if you find any skull by this uh, parameters, you can establish that this is a, this, uh, is a male uh, skull or this is a female skull. So, so this is another picture uh, which denote the large canines you can see in a male while the rounded chin you can a square chin in a uh, male and the rounded chin in a female. So <clears throat> a few other, uh, like the mistroid process, clearly you can see here the uh, very larger in a male while the smaller in a female. So second, uh, for the sex determination, we use the pelvis girdle and pelvis girdle always play an important role in a male and female for the identification. Either the pelvis girdle is from a male or is a female. So these are the few parameters in a pelvis girdle which establish either the uh, pelvis girdle which recovered from the uh, scene of the crime or the disaster is a male or the female. So the size, in a male, the size of the pelvic girdle is smaller and the narrower with heavier and the thicker bones, while in a female it's a bigger and the wide uh, with the lighter and the denser bones. The sacrum part of the pelvis is a longer and narrower in a, in a male and a wider and shorter in a, and less curved in a female. Uh, pelvic girdle, uh, pelvic uh, bream are, is a uh, hard shape in a uh, male while the slightly oval in a female. Estabulum is larger in male and uh, smaller in female. Ilium is a more uh, vertical with the more curved iliac crest present in a male while in a female it is a less vertical with a less curved iliac crest. Ischial fibrosity is a longer, it's a close together and more laterally projecting in a uh, male pelvis while in the female pelvis it is a shorter farther apart and more medially projecting. Pubic arc is narrow in, uh, narrow in a V shape in a male, while the pubic arc is wider in a U shape in a female. So by this picture, you can understand. Uh, 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 next, I'll show the picture. So other features uh, for the comparison, like a uh, uh, sciatic no uh, notch is a, in a male, it is a narrower, while in a female, it is a wider. Coccyx is a projected inward and uh, uh, it is a immovable, while in a female, it is a flexible and a, Straighter. Uh, purpose of uh, design is a male pelvis is designed to support a heavy body uh, with a stronger muscle structures, while the female pel pelvis is designed uh, for the purpose of child wearing and the easier delivery. So, obturator foramen is a rounded in a uh, male pelvis, while the oval in a female pelvis. Pelvic bone is a heavy and thick in a male and uh, thin and dense in a female. So pelvic outlet is a narrow and the wide in a female, uh, narrow in a male and the wide in a female. So uh, you can see uh, the structure, uh, you can see the differences where the uh, pubic arch, you can see the v shape and here the more wider, here the less wider. You can see the sexual prominency, you can see the flared ileum, 
So these are the features which establish that it is of the male or it is of the female. So uh, again, this is another picture. We can here you can see the more of obtuse, uh, less obtuse angle. Here is the more obtuse angle. So you can see here it is a more than 100 degree in a female angle and less than uh, 90 degree in a male. So then uh, we recover our long bones from the scene of crime. Uh, or the from any disaster. So on the basis of long bones, how we can establish the individuals, how we can establish the individual identity uh, or individual height. So these are the few uh, measurement by which, uh, uh, because four long bones are usually used for the identification of the height or the establishment is uh, estimating the height of the individual. So these uh, uh, four bones are the femur, tibia, humerus, and the radius. So we all know the where all these uh, bones are present. So uh, femur is uh, in a, it's also known as a thigh bone. Tibia is a lower limb bone. Humerus is a tickling bone. It's also known as a tickling bone and the upper arm bone and radius is the uh, lower arm bone. So these are the bones and by this uh, height is establishing by giving some indices and by giving some uh, few uh, fixed indices and that fixed indices uh, tell that uh, what are the individual and uh, who individual uh, and uh, by this, if, if any bone is recovered, what can be a height of the individual? So, uh, is, uh, so estimate the height in a case of female. If we re, uh, uh, re, if we receive a female, so length of the female, which measure through the osteometric board earlier, which I showed. So, you can measure the length of, of the um, uh, femur and multiply it by the 2.21 indices and uh, plus 61. Point one uh, sixty one point four one centimeter that give a exact uh, approx height of an individual because it's estimation it's not a complete or that we can say it's a five foot like one seventy eight centimeter so it's not going to give a exact height but it's an estimation of the height and somehow it is very near to the exact height in a female uh, in a um, femur it is calculated uh, through the multiplication factor of the two point two one. And uh, in a tibia, it is calculated with the height of the individual. In case of female, it is uh, multiplied with the uh, multiplication factor 2.53 plus 72.57 centimeter. So that gives the exact uh, height in a centimeter. Uh, by the humerus, uh, the multiplication factor is 3.14 plus 64.97. In a radius, in case of female, the multiplication factor is 3.87 plus 73.50 by which we can reach to a height of an individual. If you, if you, you know, able to calculate the height, if you are just only getting a femur or you're just getting a tibia or a humerus or a radius. So multiplying the height of the femur, uh, tibia, humerus with uh, this respective multiplication factor and adding into the fixed uh, uh, things. And these measurement is for the Caucasian population. And these measurement varied from the Mongoloid, these measurement varied from the, uh, you know, Negroid also. So uh, these all data, all multiplication factor and the height is available onto the different uh, books and the internet also that what multiplication factor you require to calculate in the Negroid, what multiplication factor you require to calculate into the case of uh, Mongoloid. So these, these uh, multiplication is factor for the multiplication factor is for the Caucasoid only. So in case of male, once we require to uh, estimate, it, estimate the height and we have a femur bone. So <clears throat> by that, uh, we use the multiplication factor 2.23 into the length of the femur plus 69.08. In, uh, in case of tibia of the male, the multiplication factor is used 2.39 plus 81.68. In case of humerus, multiplication factor is used 2.97 for the male and plus, uh, plus fix height 73.57 of the person. And then in a radius uh, bone, it is multiplied by 3.65 plus uh, uh, fixed height of the 80.41 centimeter. So like this, uh, on this basis, we can reach to the conclusion to that uh, what can be a estimated height of the individual. Like if the length of the individual is 10 uh, or the, uh, 20 centimeter, so 20 multiplied by 2.21 plus 61.41 in the female, while in the male, it's a 20 multiplied by 2.23 plus 69.08 in case of male. So this is an estimation because there is a chance that these factors are not always fixed for the 
uh, because sometimes longer lower bone is longer upper bone is not that much longer you have seen that people with a long leg and a short arm or the you have must seen uh, people with a uh, long arm and a short leg so these factors are usually uh, defined by having a calculation or by having a research on a good number of data like a calculation to the different population uh, uh, done by a different research by the different anthropologist and by that research they reach to the conclusion of giving this multiplication factor which uh, come to the estimation of the height of the individual through the long bones so once uh, you recover any uh, long bone from the scene of crime you can uh, uh, you can establish as this height of the individual so by this this is the method by which uh, long bone is uh, measured the uh, length of the this is the automatic board and this uh, automatic scale is there and that automatic scales uh, give you the height of the uh, bone and uh, by calculating this height you have to multiply with the uh, that uh, multiplication factor and then you can add that fixed number to establish the individual height so you can see this is a radius bone this is a humerus and this is a femur bone and this is a measurement done on the femur so this kind of uh, long bones used for the individual height identification so you you have seen if the bone is, is shorter in size like you see the uh, <clears throat> this radius is shorter in size so the fixed number in radius is higher the fixed number of radius is higher is 80 while the femur is longer in height so the uh, number is 69.08 and it is difference of almost a, 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 a 11 cm so this difference is covered through the multiplication factor and by that you can uh, you uh, reach uh, anthropologists reach to a conclusion that this is a estimated height of an individual so <clears throat> this is the method by which we establish the height of an individual by the long bones so <clears throat> why these forensic evidences are uh, or the any forensic evidences are important and why this is used as a personal identification because all kind of either you consider dna or you consider fingerprint or you consider a bones or you consider dna fiber forensic uh, uh, evidence or any evidence so these evidences have a few characteristics and these few characteristics once we able to prove that uh, you know uniqueness of that evidence into court of law then court only can accept this kind of evidence so what are the these characteristics like uh, forensic evidences are always reliable they give a reliable result they uh, that is uh, all the scientific uh, community you know do a uh, several kind of, several years of research and by doing a several years years, uh, years of research they reach to a conclusion and by that they formulate they make a formula they make a multiplication factor they design a Uh, like uh, techniques like for dna they design a techniques for cyber they design a tool for handwriting they design a different instrument so that's why it's so done by uh, accepted by the scientific community and if scientific community is working so hard for making these evidences reliable then court you uh, uh, take this as a reliable evidence so that's why forensic evidences play a very important role because of the reliability Uh, and uh, you know uh, it's always uh, believable when uh, you present any evidence a uh, court should see the your finding court always find that yes you have established the individual's height by these multiplication factor and these multiplication factors are established by the different scientific community or you have identified that uh, the skull which is found is belongs to a female like in case of sina bora or in case of uh, nithari uh, uh, like child and uh, like uh, male and female uh, child so uh, it is already established and these parameters were used by the researcher used by the scientists who are working into the uh, different laboratory and by that once the established parameters were used then uh, court believe on such kind of examination such kind of study and if you uh, follow the scientific uh, parameters it's make a uh, evidence in the uh, admissible into the court of law and it's make authentic by this authentic uh, uh, evidence court rely and is find that is yes these scientific parameters are uh, completely and uh, these uh, reports are saying this uh, on the basis of the scientific parameters and if in any case court find that these parameters are not up to the mark or it is not going to be accepted by the scientific community 
or court to think that yes there is some lacuna in the examination there are some advanced technique already available into the field but a expert use a old technique and which is not giving a more <clears throat> authentic and the complete result then definitely court is not going to make an admissible for such evidence so uh, updation of the knowledge uh, even anthropological uh, forensic anthropological wants study are nowadays is very less used but yes it is used in a, um, a few cases and where uh, it is used by the different uh, computerized tools also for the uh, stature estimation uh, they use some uh, other me measurement nowadays particularly it is used for the facial reconstructions and uh, identification of uh, gender identification like i say it's a male or it's a female so these are the characteristics by which uh, courts should rely on the forensic evidences which is submitted by a forensic expert after the examination on the uh, best available scientific parameter into uh, established by the scientific uh, community on the standards then definitely these forensic evidences are reliable and admissible into the court of law so <clears throat> so these two expert opinion recently came and you all have this is a, a this year only two uh, opinion came from the different expert and if you say the why the court has make a point or the media has made a multiple article on these points so you can see uh, that as uh, strangulated uh, bones you all can read these i'm not going to comment here any uh, of the reports so you all can read these reports why court has raised a question the why media is raising a question on the forensic examination on the forensic examination reports or uh, like a face, facial reconstruction the software which is used is not a reliable software why uh, a reliable software is not used what are the lacuna available into the software and it is very well elaborated into the court and court find that yes these are the lacuna which is done by the expert so and also media publish Uh, such kind of uh, several articles you can find into the things so as i said i am uh, uh, doing one investigation at present so uh, 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 so uh, from here i am ending my presentation because uh, i just receive a call so for inter sir i'll uh, like to take few questions within uh, 10 15 minute and sorry for the short presentation just because of the lack of time so we totally understand and first of all i thank you very much for making some time now for the you know audience here the audience now the session is open for the questions you can please raise your hands in case you want to pose the questions to the speakers okay yes marvel go ahead hello marvel yes. hello sir can you hear me yes yes please okay uh, good evening sir good evening uh, sir i am having two questions mm -hmm. uh, sir if we got two or three bones such as femur humerus or tibia on crime scene then how can we estimate primarily that uh, all that recovered bones belong to the same individual or other persons just by visual examination for like uh, yes, yes. so uh, let me answer this one see uh, just uh, finding a bone like if you are finding only one tibia one femur and uh, one humerus at the scene of crime and what kind of scene of crime is first you have to check either is a disaster or is some murder so if you are finding is uh, any uh, homicidal or the murder scene of uh, crime where a body was buried or the body was thrown and it is eaten by some animal or other things so uh, establishing either is from the one individual or more than one individual is always tough but yes by that you can reach to the conclusion uh, see if anyone is uh, you know uh, killing someone and they are throwing the uh, body parts into the different area right so uh, during the investigation investigating officer have to look that uh, how many you know missing complaint is there and what are the uh, people uh, can like uh, suspected individual like if there are two missing person then uh, establishing just on the basis of uh, uh, bones available at the one one bone you said because there is two female in a human there is a two tibia in a human two humerus and if you are just finding one one at the scene of crime then definitely is a uh, very tough to establish either is from the same individual or not but yes 
once you reach to the conclusion or once you calculate the height after calculation of the height you can find that uh, yes this is the uh, height of the individual and if there are two individual two missing individual so by that way you can reach to the individual height if there is not very you know uh, less difference between the height if one individual is 5 feet another is 6 feet and your calculation is giving that bones belongs to the 5 8 5 9 or 5 or, or 6 right there are there are chances that uh, height of the individual is 6 feet and your calculation coming 5 point uh, 10 only just because of the instrument error or the measurement error also so there is a possibility but yes, if there is a more than two individuals of the same height, it's very tough to establish through the forensic anthropology. For that, we have to go for the personal identification through the DNA. Now your second question. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. My second question is, how can we estimate height from fragmental, uh, fragmental remains, sir? It's very tough. Uh, see, the height estimation through the long bones in only, you know, even uh, there are height estimation was done by uh, several experts. You just read uh, Professor Nath studies, you will find the Karyal studies and uh, many several studies are present on the internet uh, through the fragment, like uh, small bones. They have uh, done the study through the, you know, uh, just on me uh, measurement of the phalanges. They have uh, done the established, uh, height establishment through the small bones, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, just uh, metacarpals or the tarsals. By that also a study had been done. But a fragmented bone, if you say, is very tough because you cannot establish that uh, what a length can be because you are just getting a one end. So just by getting a fragmented bone and what is the you know uh, length of the fragment that is also important. So you can reach to the, some conclusion that it is a uh, uh, you know uh, from a uh, like a, what can be a height of individual. But yes, uh, reaching to a final conclusion is very tough. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. First, go ahead. Sparsh Koel. Good evening, sir. Yes, good evening, Sparsh. Sir, uh, I need to know that whenever uh, we find the bones, any bone of the body part, how we'll come to know that it is the actual real bone, not a man-made or artificial bone? See, the, you know, uh, when an expert who uh, will going to establish that either it's artificial or not, it's uh, just on the basis of the expert knowledge and the expert, because uh, expert experience. If someone who is uh, working as a forensic anthropologist, right? As I earlier declared that I have not done any case related to the bones examination, but yes, I have studied during my masters and other things. So uh, just by seeing the bone or even you can uh, give there are pores, there are different uh, texture of the bone is different. And if you are getting a, uh, either it's a cast bone, either it's a POP bone or some other bone, so touch, rough texture, and there are different other parameters by which you can easily, uh, you know, differentiate differentiate between an actual human bone or the animal bone and the bone which is created by the any uh, material like a POP or any other thing. It's easy to establish. Okay. So there uh, is a question from Vansika, how can we do personal identification in mass disaster cases where you found a skeletal remain, uh, a skeletal remain? See, in a mass disaster cases, uh, as I shown one picture earlier, that uh, you know uh, uh, there is a box where you have to establish the bones, where you have to segregate the bones, and uh, if you find a bunch of bones, like there are three uh, femur, so there is a possibility that all three femur can be of the same height, but there is a very strong possibility that all four, uh, three bones cannot be uh, of a same height, so same length. So by segregating on the basis of their length, height, then you have to make a structure of the whole body. Like first you have to, uh, if you're in a disaster cases, if you're just getting a skeletal remain. So first you have to establish the skeleton, then you have to establish the vertebra, sternum, then uh, humerus, then uh, radius, ala, then pelvis girdle, then femur, then tibia, fibula, then uh, you know, phalanges. So like that, once you start arranging the bones, into the different category, then you will find that this bones will belong to the particular individual or more than two individuals. Hope I answer your uh, question once again. Okay, uh, sir, uh, I have uh, one question from uh, uh, UD from Indonesia. So the mm -hmm. question is uh, based on Indian system. Do you have limit of time to examine the bones for completing the report? 
example one week or longer mm -hmm. what is the time frame in india what we usually follow is what the question is see uh, uh, see um, uh, ud uh, he uh, he is a very uh, you know senior person so uh, ud i just like to answer uh, this question in india there is no limitations of the time frame in a disaster cases once like uh, just an example one disaster happened uh, of the bsf plane crash so all the bone was uh, established the individual and the 12 uh, individual were there and they all 12 were established uh, uh, identity was established within uh, i think i can say 24 hours by the professor adars and the team of the aims but in cases of the murder and other uh, things like uh, uh, you know bones were recovered from the forest in a case of the sinagora it was uh, uh you know for the month it was in a hospital there was no things so it depend upon the case to case but there is as per my knowledge there is no fixed protocol that we have to establish or we have to give the opinion on the skeleton material on within these days number one second is also depend upon the you know either the laboratory has the expertise of the forensic uh, science either uh, forensic anthropology either this uh, you know uh, examination was done by a medicine doctor or any forensic professional which is who is working as a forensic anthropologist into the uh, indian forensic lab so there are lots of variation and depend upon state to state few state they have the medical legal division in their own forensic science laboratory few uh, states in india uh, they have their medical colleges who give the opinion on the basis of uh, their uh, skeletal remains examination Uh, one question from the youtube participant mm -hmm. uh saika berwal mm -hmm. does the multiplication factor to estimate the height have a particular name mm -hmm. uh, question is does the multiplication factor to estimate the height have a particular name? i mean is there a procedure is there a name is what the question is yeah see the multiplication factor there are different you know as i said uh, multiplication factors are there are different classification was given by the different scientists and different anthropometry uh, measurement uh, scientists who have given in their books and other things so multiplication factor was basically a factor which is a fixed number uh, which is multiply a fixed length uh, calculated or the measured length of the bone and given by a some uh, you know numbers by that it uh, reached to the conclusion and uh, uh, for the uh, you know estimation of the height of the individual Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. In fact, the next question is, sir, Deepthi Parve, can we say the person was blind by examining the skull? Uh, it's very tough to comment. Uh, any, you know, forensic medicine people can uh, give a better answer than me. And it's very tough because you know, if the bone, if the uh, you know eyes uh, is not present, only the skeleton is present. So it's very tough as per my as per my knowledge. Uh, so i'm taking the last question for the r so i'll allow aditi sharma to pose her question aditi go ahead good evening sir am i audible yeah yeah please aditi uh, yes sir my question is uh, what are the softwares we use in india for facial reconstruction and what are the success rate see there are different software used by the different experts like there are some uh, forensic gpa they are using and the success rate you know expert can only uh, tell that uh, what is the success rate so i think uh, you can watch a lecture by the azur uh, uh, who delivered recently two three days back on 19 i think on the facial uh, reconstruction and he explained many software which is already available on the youtube recently it was organized by me with uh, i helped uh, and uh, it was organized by dr aman chaudhary so you can uh, watch on the youtube you will find all the detail about this okay sir thank you uh okay, i can take one or two question more sir one or two questions okay i'll allow uh, samuel hello hello yes samuel yeah how are you yeah i'm good yeah yeah i, I, yeah, I, I just want to know how do we differentiate human skull and uh, like um um a monkey a chimpanzee and ape skull see uh, for you know human and non human if a skull of the ch uh, chimpanzee they have the more protuberance their you know chin is longer their uh, zygomatic arch is in a different shape 
so the uh, all you know differentiation factor are already established into the different literature so you just uh, if you just find any anthropometry anthropometry book you will find the differences between the skull of a monkey skull of the uh, human and skull of the chimpanzee so there are different measurement which easily you know uh, is easily it can be easily established establishing between male and female is sometimes tough but establishing between a human and non human is not okay thank you okay yeah go ahead neha khatse what is it telling for aditi sharma हेलो हेलो सर यस हेलो सर कैन यू यू या 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 आर ऑडिबल प्लीज आस्क क्वेश्चन ओके सर आई जस्ट वांट टू आस्क यू लाइक इज देयर एनी पर्टिकुलर डिफरेंस और पर्टिकुलर कैरेक्टरिस्टिक दैट वी कैन फाइंड इन अ पेल्विक बॉन ऑफ ट्रांसजेंडर पीपल ट्रांसजेंडर पीपल is there any particularity in their uh, uh see uh, frankly speaking i have not read about the uh, you know pelvic girdle structure of the uh, uh, transgender but okay. uh, uh, there is a chances that there will be difference because you know the male pelvis is uh, you know designed for carrying a body weight and female pelvis is designed uh, pelvis is designed to uh, give the birth of the child and in the transgender both are you know not uh, as fixed as it is in a male and the female so i think there will be a difference okay sir but you can okay. find a good thank study you. on this uh, i have not read any uh, you know article about this oh. okay sir okay okay thank you uh is it possible to distinguish between the bones from which body it is be it belongs to in case when the remains are merged yes it is possible okay it is possible and uh, it can be uh, you know either is a right hand uh, or is a left hand or is a left sternum or the right sternum it can be uh, if is a left humerus or the right humerus it can be said this there are characteristics in a uh, different characteristics for the left uh, humerus there are different characteristics for the right humerus similarly in the finger in all bones have the different characteristics for the left and right side ayush go ahead hello sir Good evening, sir. Good evening, Ayush. Uh, this is Ayush. Uh, I have a question that uh, how can you identify a person on the basis of skull in case if a girl and boy are twins? See, uh, if a girl and boy having the same semi hemisphere or the same size of the skull, then it's very difficult to establish the individual either is from the uh, twin uh, or out of the twin which uh, belongs to the uh, particular. Uh, like if there are a and b is a uh, a and b is a boy and uh, we find both the skull from the a and b and the size and other uh, photographic uh, like uh, anti mortem data showing the same structure or the same shape of the uh, you know their faces so it's difficult to reach a conclusion that either is from the which uh, which uh, you know uh, skull is belong from a and which is belong from the b it can be only established through the dna examination if it is not the uh, mono genetic about the twins Thank you, sir. Ayush Rawat, go ahead. Am I audible, sir? Yes, Ayush. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Can we guess the age of individual by skeleton? If yes, how? Yes, uh, by the you know by examination of the different suture present into the skull. Uh, so by you know uh, few suture give the age uh, which is you know few uh, uh, before eighteen year, few uh, few uh, suture. Huge after 25 years. So there are the uh, future fusing, uh, you know, uh, parameters by which you can establish the age of the individual in a skeleton material and uh, in a living being. Uh, you can establish this through the different X-ray technique. Neha, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. 
yeah so uh, i just read an uh, article that uh, gfsu uh, they the student researchers have created uh, 3d reconstruction uh, things mm -hmm. so uh, uh, they mentioned that the bones can be reconstructed via 3d mo remodeling mm -hmm. and the fragile things can be studied in that mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is it reliable when it comes to legal proceedings uh for the legal proceedings fundamentation can uh, you know because we are not uh, doing any examination on the actual uh, exhibit yes sir the exhibit we are giving through a you know 3d printer or uh, making a you uh, modulation so uh, that algorithm what algorithm we are using for the establishment or the creation of that particular bones if it is exactly you know uh, we by the different year of research as you said uh, you know research published by the gfsu and yes, yes. published on a large database and it is uh, you know published in a large database and accepted by the scientific community then definitely uh, it can be uh, it can be admissible but uh, uh, it depend upon uh, which kind of uh, you know parameter they are using for creation of the 3d uh, bones and through the fragile Yes, sir. True. Narendra sir can uh, uh, let comment on this for the legal admissibility of uh, any partial and uh, creation. Because uh, if you are getting a one centimeter and if you are creating to two centimeter, it can be one point nine. It can be two point one also. Yes, sir. For the you know, for estimation, it can be it can be a useful. But for a giving a exact uh, result, uh, uh, sir, what is uh, your uh, comment? indeed the uh, as you rightly mentioned the application has a very significant matter to discuss here because if it is just uh, identification that is different than proving something so when we discuss about identification this is application of uh, this technology in the mass disaster cases yes sir so if if that needs to be understood as identification that is the reasonable probability what they are trying to establish in case it need to be proved okay that this belongs to this xyz person only that requires this methodology plus the other methodologies what we have been using so far yes this 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 tool this technology acts as a diagnostic tool but yet the expert has a very uh, important role to play nice yes, sir thank you sir yeah uh, parinder sir i just want to uh, yeah uh, sir uh, indeed uh, uh, just a uh, 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 procedural aspect we will uh, connect the word of thanks uh, palguni Yes, sir. Fine. Good evening to all. I am Palguni Hoja. On behalf of Clue for Evidence Foundation and the entire team, extend my very hearty vote of thanks to the speaker of the day, Dr. Ranjit Kumar Singh, forensic expert and CEO, uh, Smiths Forensic Lab, for sparing his valuable time from his busy schedule and sharing with us such no uh, knowledgeable session on. Uh, Personal identification by skeleton material. Thank you, sir. The session was very interesting and filled with knowledge. The session covered all the aspects of forensic anthropology principle used for personal identification of a person from skeleton remains. We learned about various questions we come across during the analysis of these uh, remains in the laboratory. it highlighted the various features or the basis of which one can establish the identity of a, an individual and uh, the cases being handled in the present scenario in this field i would like to express my profound gratitude to parinder sir for giving us the opportunity and guidance which helped in the successful completion of the session i would like to thank our volunteers without whose contribution the session would not have been possible last but not the least i would like to thank all the participants for their active participation and and patience throughout the session we are looking forward for your active participation in the coming webinars too thank you very much thank you for coming